Welcome to yet another session of Prabodhan Manchan. As we all get set for a season of festivities, a very warm welcome to our guest, Dr. Vinita Navalkar. I request Sri Madan Vajpayee of Prabodhan Manchan to felicitate her in our usual tradition. As much as technology is an enabler, uh, over-dependence can also become the single point of failure. We saw one example just now, but we've had another one earlier when our bulk WhatsApp messaging system also responded and, and we had some delays in sending those messages. So please bear with us while we get that corrected. And a request, uh, please update the Pravodar Mancha number as a contact in your address book. This will enable you to at least receive broadcast messages. In the last months, uh, and I think this is for the last couple of months that I say, the rockets that were firing our imagination weren't manufactured or sent from Shivakashi. They were being launched from Sri Harikota. As India's space program continued scaling one summit after another, the fascinating journey leading to and continuing beyond the Chandrayaan mission is something which inspires every Indian. And keeping in mind Prabodhan Mancha's commitment to have Prabodhan on relevant subjects, we have a very learned speaker today with us. Dr. Vinita Suresh Navalkar, PhD from TIFR, is a highly accomplished senior science writer with a solid academic background and over a decade of experience in science communication, education and research. She has proven expertise in crafting engaging technical content, extensive knowledge in astronomy instrumentation, and a successful track record of projects in both domestic and public domains. For a complex technical subject, I am sure we couldn't have got a more accomplished speaker. Welcome, ma'am. As always, we have a few questions with us uh, sent by our team and by some of the audience. But for a topic like this, we would love to hear more from all of you. So we will try and cover as many questions as you send. We will screen them for appropriateness and brevity. But do give your questions to our volunteers. Uh, with that, over to you, Dr. Navalkar. Good morning all of you and uh, well it's a nice Sunday morning and uh, I'm going to bombard you a bit with technical stuff but don't worry it won't be too technical. Uh, I'm sure you will enjoy uh, all that has been happening not only in last month but all that has been happening for last 50 to 60 years. I will uh, go through it. Uh, of course we are all very happy and very proud that uh, India finally managed to land on South Pole of Moon uh, last month. But uh, the lunar missions, as we uh, see, have actually started way back in 1960s. Okay, so uh, I will be taking a brief overview uh, with uh, all those things. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Can we go ahead? Yeah, next. So, uh, it's a video. Yeah. yeah. So this, as you see, is the most powerful rocket, any any powerful rocket that we have right now. Okay, this is uh, Saturn V, through which uh, the famous Apollo 11 uh, landed on Moon with three astronauts. So uh, it is one of the most powerful rockets. See, when we are talking about space technology or sending something out on other planets or Moon, for example. The most important part of all this thing is the rocket. Okay, and um, when I say powerful rocket, it actually depends upon um, you know how much weight you can put into space. That is more important. So uh, when I'm telling you this is a powerful rocket, it means it could 
take with it or the total weight of that rocket rocket during launch was 44000 kgs that was the weight it could take that is saturn 5 and to date we don't have any other rocket as capable as this rocket so this was one of the most powerful rocket humans have ever built i will not go into which country built and all that but humans have ever built this is the most powerful rocket and uh, next but you know, uh, before this, this was built in 1960s. But even before this, if you uh, date back to 19, rather it all started in 1890s. But the first uh, propellant, uh, next. first propellant, liquid propellant rocket that was launched was actually in 1920s. And uh, that was by, um, yeah. That was by uh, an American scientist, uh, Robert Godart. Okay, so in 1890s, actually, the work started uh, by three people independently. There were three different peoples: one uh, people, one in USA, one in Germany, and one in Russia. They independently started designing rockets, but this guy especially designed, made, and la launched a liquid propellant rocket in 1926. Okay, and uh, of course the Space Center is named after him in USA. And uh, I've been using this word liquid propellant. Okay, so we have rockets which use different kinds of fuels. So uh, generally uh, the first initial rockets all started or the, fa or the basic type of a rocket what we actually uh, use is the one that we use in Diwali. You know those rockets. These are normal gunpowder rockets. That the idea is same that you have you give a thrust against the gravitational force and something moves up. So the idea of rocketry is that is the basic idea, right? So there is a normal gunpowder that is filled into a small cylinder and it goes up. Okay. So initial rockets actually started with a normal gunpowder, but uh, people realize slowly that if you use a liquid fuel, a gunpowder is a solid fuel. If you use a liquid fuel, you will get better thrust. And uh, Robert Godart actually designed the liquid fuel rocket in 1926 and took that. If you see the last image and see the setup, I mean, uh, these uh, images are from 1920s where he actually built a crude launch station and uh, he actually, it was a small rocket, of course, not as big as we have now. But this was the first liquid propellant filled in liquid fuels. So how do how these liquid fuels work is you have two chambers generally. Uh, one has an oxidizer and one has of actual fuel. You mix them together in a combustion chamber and that gives you the thrust to lift up. So that, that is the principle. So you generally have two tanks uh, in uh, such engines. So this was the first engine or first rocket which, uh, with uh, liquid propellant. And from there it all started that uh, and the other two people had designed uh, Harman Oberth and Konstantin from Russia. Harman Oberth was a German scientist. They both also had uh, given extensive designs of how a liquid propellant rocket should be. Not only that, all the three guys independently also discussed about having multi-stage rockets. See, now we know uh, that having a multi-stage rocket is so much important. Now, what I mean by multi-stage rocket is, uh, I'm sure all of you must have seen these uh, videos have been circulated quite a lot. Or even during the uh, Chandrayaan launch or any of the launches you must have seen that generally a rocket takes off first there are these boosters which fall off then uh, the first stage fall off falls off generally the first stage and the boosters are used to give enough lift against the earth's gravitational pull then there is a second stage which actually takes it generally to the desired altitude where it wants to go and third stage it has then the second stage is kind of uh, discarded it falls back again and the third stage or the fourth stage depending upon what your rocket type is it gives you the uh, you know the horizontal velocity to put it in the correct orbit or if you want to go beyond if it is earth orbit then that will be used to put it in the correct orbit or if you want to go beyond earth to moon or to mars anywhere then a uh, third and fourth stage itself is used to take your instrument to that location and then put it in the respective orbit so this actually helps in reducing the weight at every stage so your lift up weight is generally very high but as you go further and further, you can reduce the weight. Reducing the weight means you're reducing the usage of fuel. Okay, so that is more effective rather than having one single rocket and sending it to moon or sending it to Mars or even uh, Earth orbit becomes more expensive because that means you are keeping the whole mass together till that point where you want to reach. So it is all. 
sorry it is always better to have uh, rockets with different stages and all these three guys independently gave that idea that we can have a multi stage rocket okay so uh, this is where actually rocketry started initially of course the idea of rockets came with uh, world war 1 and 2 that's where it it was for the military purpose uh, where uh, rocketry was mainly used for missile purpose and all but of course it was very quickly uh, especially post world war 2 uh, quickly it was used for space research by both usa and russia at that time okay uh, next um all said and done uh, next is it easy to go in space now we have so many rockets so many countries making new new rockets but is it easy to go in space absolutely not in spite of the fact that we have been sending so many rocket each mission is a new mission okay each mission is a new mission anything can go wrong even if you have a robust condition you have used your rocket n number of times last minute anything can go wrong and there are several tests that you have to take before your uh, you know rocket is ready your satellite is ready to be launched uh, next the most important thing is um, cost you know uh, it's this is a rough estimate and this keeps changing as and when okay so it's literally 2000 rupees per gram is the cost that it comes to launch anything in space and you have to minimize your weight because of that so whatever instruments you make even the fuel that is what i was trying to say that fuel has to be as less as possible so that you reduce the weight and you reduce the overall cost okay so your instrument has to be compact uh, next it has to be compact because uh, you know the bigger the rocket obviously you are going to increase the weight mass okay so again it has to be compact and lighter in weight so that is very much important uh, next another very important thing is the power you cannot have instruments which use very high power generally all these instruments work with 12 volt dc supply okay most of these electronics that is there on board instruments they generally work with that low of course there are other propulsion systems which actually guide the rocket in different directions those are uh, much heavy wattage but not more than 100 watts okay so it is very important that uh, you use low power because the only two sources of power is uh, one is a solar panel but uh, the problem with solar panel is uh, the bigger the solar panel is going to give you more power but it is also going to increase your weight and volume so again you would like to restrict that that you will only have the power which is necessary and nothing extra so that is very much important uh, other way of having a power is having a uh, nuclear power uh, there are nuclear to electric converters which you can use ion based converters you can use those but again uh, in, in, that is also a limitation that how much you can use so so far if you see the history uh, all the instruments all the satellites which orbit earth or go up to the martian orbit are solar powered and beyond martian orbit all missions are nuclear powered with an exception of only one mission that is juno mission which is sent to jupiter which is completely solar powered but they have huge solar panels huge it's a very big size uh, solar panels and a huge um, instrument that is put up near jupiter it is orbiting jupiter uh, currently so that is the only solar power instrument or satellite which is beyond martian orbit currently otherwise all satellites are uh, uh, solar powered if it is below i mean up to the martian orbit next this is very important because whatever design you make has to be robust Uh, because if the launch is so violent that anything can come off and for that you have to take n number of test vibration test here down on the ground so that whenever there is a launch whenever you put the, that instrument for launching it doesn't so generally what happens is uh, uh, these launch there are these uh, vibration pads at every launch centers uh, isro has one in bangalore so uh, you you vibrate the entire instrument part by part and then the assembled instrument together with twice the frequency of what it is going to be during the launch okay so if you know that it can sustain that frequency then definitely it can sustain uh, whatever uh, vibrations you get during the launch so and this happens multiple times like for example if you have one satellite with five instruments so then each instrument developed separately is put on to the vibration table tested multiple times then that inst all those instruments collectively when it fits on the satellite body that entire system is again put into vibrations and tested and finally when multiple times and all this is done 
it is considered to be QC to be put into a satellite, uh, to put into a rocket to be launched. So this multiple test, uh, you know, uh, happen uh, this, and that is the reason minimum time when an instrument is developed to launch generally takes one year because you have to uh, go through all these tests. Not only that, there's another test which is very much important and that is thermal test. Okay, it's called thermovac test. So the entire instrument or satellite, however big it is, it put it's put into a chamber. You know, you have a room size chambers over there in Bangalore and it's put into a chamber in a vacuum and uh, you heat the temperatures to uh, roughly 400, 500 degrees and then even get it back to minus 200 degrees to see that there is no deformation, especially in the metal parts. Okay, so all these thermal tests are also done because it's quite possible that during launch or even later when it directly faces the sun at times, generally all instruments are kept quiet, they are shut down whenever it faces the sun. But in case it does face the sun or any other intense uh, source, then it should not heat up. So that is the reason thermal tests are also done. So uh, next, yeah, so that is uh, that is the reason these two tests, whenever these are the basic tests that are always carried out on any instrument and then only instrument is uh, selected or QC'd, you know, the quality checks are done to be launched. Okay, next. Another very important thing is the radiation of charged particles that is there outside. Okay, or any other radiation as well. So here on the earth, we are protected. Like our atmosphere blocks most of the charged particles that some come from the sun or outer space. But once you are out above the atmosphere, that is not the case. So you must have seen all the instruments that are launched are actually covered in that gold foil. All images, if you see, all, everything that goes up is always covered in the gold foil. So it is actually not uh, only gold. It is uh, generally a film of uh, 15 to 20 layers with different uh, uh, different material layers inside and the top layer is generally gold and that uh, kind of blocks your radiation so it saves you from uh, you know if there are any sensitive detectors inside see because uh, most of the time whatever detectors you have inside are very sensitive to small light because you want to you know very tiny fraction of light because you want to go and search for say a dim sources in the sky or something like that so generally these detectors are very sensitive to uh, charges and very um, small amount of light. So you don't want any radiation or any charge particles affecting your electronics inside or any detectors inside. So this is something that you have to take care. And uh, next, and another very important thing that, that goes, uh, that's a bottom line about everything is you cannot repair satellites. If it is gone, we just saw what happened with Chandrayaan 2. If it's just last few seconds that things went long, but that mission was lost, you know. So you cannot repair anything. So whatever it is, it has to be robust. It's much easier if you talk about funding or if you talk about finances, it's much easier to rebuild a new mission rather than sending astronauts to repair things out there. You know, robotically, if you can repair something, it's a different story. But uh, if sending out people to repair, Hubble is only satellite, by the way, only telescope that has been serviced five times and that's how its life increased from two years to 35 years and it's still counting okay so uh, that was the only mission that was serviced in space um, uh, by doing space work so but no other satellite or even nasa for that matter is not in the position of sending out astronauts to service any any of the satellite even if it is earth orbiting forget about anything that is sent to moon or mars but even if it is earth orbiting no one is going to service or repair a satellite in space anymore. Okay, So that in spite of all these things, yes, a satellite or all these instruments are yet a powerful tool of learning science or, you know, for that matter, even in our day-to-day -day life of communication, defense and everything. So all this thing goes beyond, behind every satellite that is launched. It is not only about astronomy or, uh, you know, uh, research, but it is about any satellite that is launched, all these tests and everything has to be taken care of. Okay, next. Yeah, so uh, let me go back to 1950s when the actual space race started. Okay, so idea, as I said, initially the rocketry was all uh, uh, up to for military purposes. But uh, slowly, post-World War II, uh, things changed. People started thinking more about, initially about space race and then about science research. But uh, that's how it started. And initially, of course, uh, Russia was quite, uh, USSR was quite in forefront. And um, they launched the first Sputnik, first uh, man-made object to orbit Earth. That was Sputnik 1 in 1957. And then immediately, uh, 1958, four months, literally four months, uh, Sputnik 1 was launched in October. And the next January, they launched Sputnik 2 with a dog Laika. 
um, in it. Uh, unfortunately, the Sputnik 2 was not designed to come back, so the dog could not uh, survive in space. Just few hours after the launch, the dog uh, could not sustain all the pressures. And uh, but yeah, that was the first living being out in space. Okay, uh, so uh, they were quite forefront. Not only that, within three years, but before that, they also managed some lunar missions. And in 1961, not only uh, like sending robotic missions, they actually uh, made Yuri Gagarin uh, go around the Earth. So he was the first human in space uh, orbiting Earth. And uh, they were quite forefront. I mean, they had excellent um, rocketry systems by then. And their initial missions were absolutely good. Really, I can say that up to 66, 67, their missions were absolutely good. Uh, they did a series of missions. I mean, uh, they planned everything together. But they did a, did a series of missions, like Earth orbiting missions. Then they had a series of uh, lunar missions. In fact, the first lunar missions are credited to USSR. Uh, USA sent its first probe uh, called the Explore, Explorer series in 1961, and that's when uh, things uh, started taking up. You know, things um, you know speed uh, speed up in the uh, USA. But before that, uh, definitely uh, USSR was in forefront, and they gave some excellent missions before. Yeah, can we go ahead? Yeah. Um, next. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So these were the initial lunar missions that actually started in 1959. Luna 1 was in 19... Yeah. So Luna 15... Uh, sorry, Luna 1 was in 1959. And uh, this was very similar to uh, the Sputnik 1 that they had designed. So it was just a probe which went... Uh, it was a flyby. So now there are different types of missions you generally have. So one is a flyby, which means that if moon is a target, then we'll go close to the moon, just fly close to the moon, take whatever data we want to take and then go away. So it doesn't really get into the orbit of the moon. Okay, another type of mission is orbiter, which we just saw that it will fall into the orbit and continuously orbit the object. Okay, and then there are landers, soft landing, hard landing. And so these are different categories. Every mission is divided into. So Luna 1 was just a flyby. It went uh, close to moon. Uh, took few images and uh, returned uh, into the solar orbit. Generally, the flyby missions actually go into the solar orbit. They don't orbit the target uh, object at all. And of course, uh, Luna 2 was an orbiter which orbited moon for the, uh, you know, again went close to the moon but couldn't actually fall into the proper orbit around moon. Luna 3 was the first successful orbiter around moon and that was the first time we ever saw the far side of the moon. You can see the image at the center. So, um, as we see moon from Earth, we don't see the other side of the moon. So, moon, uh, one side is, I mean, if you see the orbit of the moon, it's one side is locked with the face. That face is locked with the Earth. Okay, it, its rotation speed and revolution speed around Earth is same. So, it doesn't really rotate, it doesn't really spin. We always see the same side of the moon, always. So, we, till then, this was, this happened in 1966. Luna 3 went to moon in 1966. Till then, we had no idea what is there on the other side of the moon. So, this was the first time we, though, of course, you will not appreciate this image. Now, we have 200 megapixel cameras in our phone. That time, it was not a, such a great camera. But still, this is the first ever image taken in 1966 by Luna 3. Uh, sorry, 1959, 66 they landed um, and Luna 3 and this, this was a first photo and what we found was very interesting. The side of the moon uh, facing the earth is much smoother as compared to the side of the moon that is on the opposite side. Uh, the reason is very obvious that uh, whatever meteors come, they go and strike on the far side more frequently. This side of the moon, Earth safeguards it. So if there are any meteors, generally they come towards Earth rather than going to moon. So the inner side, what we see is little, little more smoother. I am not saying that there are no craters. There are, but it's little more smoother than the far side. So far side is more cratered. So this was the first time we ever saw that. And it was actually a very successful mission. And of course, later... Um, they sent a, a lander uh, in 1966 and that was the first soft landing we achieved on the uh, uh, moon. So in 1966 itself and they went ahead in seven with uh, Luna 70. There were total 20, till date there are 25 missions. Uh, Luna 25 was uh, 
the one which we just saw before our Chandrayaan it crashed on the moon, it wasn't successful. But uh, till 24, their missions were quite successful and 17 and 21, they sent uh, the first rovers, Luna Khod rovers on moon. And uh, in fact, uh, three missions also got back soil from moon that time. Uh, but that was much later in 1970s, that was after Apollo mission. So these series started off in 1959 and continued till almost 1976. And then now, after such a long time, almost 50 years, they uh, did Luna 25. But of course, I mean, uh, that wasn't successful. Uh, there are a lot of parameters into that. But otherwise, uh, this is the first series that was actually, uh, actually went to moon and gave us pretty interesting results even before Apollo missions. Okay. Oh, next. Yeah, so this is an image uh, recently uh, with uh, Apollo, sorry, uh, Luna 25. So you can see this was an image which was taken uh, in 2020. Uh, this, uh, yeah, uh, this is the image taken in 2020 and this is the point where uh, Luna 25 crashed. So this was released by uh, NASA a few days ago and this has been taken uh, by um, uh, LRO, that is Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is currently, it's a uh, NASA orbiter, which is currently orbiting moon right now. And um, so this is the image that has been taken. Just a comparison that initially there was no uh, crater, but this this kind of crater has been formed due to the crash of Luna 25. So uh, we have Chandrayaan 2 images also that way. Uh, yeah, next. Uh, so the lot of uh, things that went into it. Generally, uh, whenever you are trying to land, do a soft landing on Moon, uh, it's very difficult as compared to soft landing on other uh, planets, especially Mars. Uh, we have been sending lot of uh, rovers to Mars by now. So, but a uh, moon, it is very difficult to do a soft landing because you do not get any assist from the atmosphere. There's no atmosphere at all. So it's much difficult to do soft landing on moon uh, as compared to Mars actually, because even a thin atmosphere at times helps you to reduce the speed, but uh, no atmosphere generally uh, becomes a difficult thing. Yeah. So, uh, of course, uh, with the success of USSR, USA was not far behind and um, the, the then President John Kennedy announced about sending humans in uh, on moon and they also made it successful. Uh, but when this Apollo program started or the planning started, there were three things. There were the most important thing that was there is how to send a rocket to moon. You know, what should be the type of the rocket and how are exactly we going to send astronauts to moon? Uh, you know, how is going to be the design of the rocket? So there were three things uh, that people thought of uh, next. Uh, first thing is the direct ascent, which was most preferred. So what do you mean by direct ascent is you have an entire rocket of whatever size. It was planned to have a rocket of 20, 75,000 kgs. You know, which could lift off with 75,000 kgs mass. But, uh, and this whole thing will actually go to the moon, uh, land there, then maybe discard certain part and again the whole thing will come back to Earth with the astronauts. So this is what was planned, okay. Another important thing about direct ascent is, um, you're not going to go into the orbit around moon. Now we have seen that most of these rockets, uh, you know, they orbit moon and then they slowly land. It takes more days, but then they slowly land. But uh, it was that time it was decided that we don't want to spend, you know, send astronauts in space for a very long duration. It has to be as short as possible. So directly it will go from Earth, will go to the moon, land astronauts, again take them back and come back to the Earth. That requires tremendous fuel. But it is one of the safest system because you don't have any joining of parts in space. Okay. So the entire uh, unit that time who was designing Apollo missions was very much for for this. But, uh, you know, the problem was uh, the president announced that within 10 years, we will send it. So building a rocket with 75,000 kgs uh, of, uh, you know, which will be able to carry a mass of 75,000 kgs was not possible within 10 years. So that was a practical difficulty. So they were trying to develop a rocket called NOAA, but that was not possible. So finally, there was another option that they thought of next. Yeah. Uh, to have um, Earth orbit rendezvous uh, next. Yeah. So what do you mean by Earth orbit rendezvous is you have uh, multiple rockets going up from the Earth. 
they will be all orbit together in the earth earth orbit and then all these rockets will be joined together so one of the rockets will carry maybe the lunar module one of the rockets will carry astronauts and then all those systems will be joined together here and then that entire one single rocket will again go to moon not orbit moon and land on moon but that also meant that from moon you have to lift off a larger mass again and uh, without orbiting if you want to directly land then you have to adjust the trajectory uh, i mean you have to fire your rocket multiple times to adjust the trajectory if it is in a orbit around moon then it's the gravitational assist that you get from the orbit uh, from the moon itself which will help you to land slowly okay but if you are directly going to go land in a parabolic path then again you need to fire it multiple times to get that soft landing done so again this or this kind of uh, this was also tricky but still people preferred this again because if anything goes wrong at least the astronauts will be in the earth orbit so if that suppose that docking goes wrong see because uh, you know you are la launching three or four rockets and then trying to dock together in space that time see i'm talking about 61 62 era i'm not talking about the current era where this is very much possible okay so that time docking in space was not a very uh, preferred idea and especially with humans if it would have been just robotic people were still okay but when humans are at stake human life is at stake this was not preferred idea so uh, definitely uh, this was still preferred over uh, joining things in a lunar orbit but eventually uh, next eventually it was decided that we will send one rocket which will have multiple uh, parts which will uh, be shredded of here itself the multi stage rocket uh, we will orbit or take one orbit around earth so that we can have some gravitational assist from the earth then put it into trans lunar uh, trajectory towards moon then have an orbit one single uh, one or two orbits around moon and then do a soft landing okay so this is fine that gives that that is uh, that will definitely ensure that you use minimum fuel but the problem was when the astronauts take up from the take, you know launch from the moon that time they have to dock with the orbiter close to moon and not close to earth so if that docking does not happen successfully the two astronauts will be forever stranded in space and that is like 3 lakh 84 kilometers away so there is nothing that you could do to get those people back here so that was a risk and that is why people were not in the entire unit was not in favor of lunar orbit rendezvous but eventually they decided to go for that because having that much of fuel was also not possible so it was a big risk at that time but within few years within few uh, years they realized that this was the best idea to do otherwise uh, i will come to that i'll talk about apollo 13 mission if it wouldn't have been lunar lunar orbit rendezvous apollo 13 would be in a big problem okay so this this was the correct idea uh, the correct way of sending astronauts uh, to moon yeah next and i will uh, i have a video here which uh, actually uh, sh which will show you now this is the uh, saturn v rocket it is this big rocket but you know by the time the astronauts come back to earth after uh, at the mission completion it is a small triangular unit at the top which returns so you can see itself here that the most of the mass that is there during launch is shredded off and what returns back is a tiny fraction of the mass so that helps us to reduce fuel at every stage you know uh, so can we play the video so let's start with the components of the ship that were discarded one by one until this became this here's the rocket that sent the astronauts into space the saturn 5 The three stages of the Saturn V each played a different role in launching Apollo on a path to the moon. We'll get to that later. On top of the rocket is the actual Apollo spacecraft. It's made up of three parts too. There's the lunar module, the component that would eventually land on the lunar surface, the service module which had propulsion systems for course corrections and entering and escaping orbit, and the command module where our three heroes were for most of the mission. And last but not least, this is the launch escape system, which was designed to pull the command module away from the rocket if something went wrong during launch. Together, all these pieces made up the Saturn V rocket and Apollo 11 spacecraft. But it's the way they came apart that made the moon landing happen. Saturn V's first stage launched Apollo, carrying the spacecraft 42 miles above the Earth and reaching a speed of about 6,000 miles per hour. The first stage then detached, and once the Saturn V's second stage kicked in, the now needless launch escape system jettisoned too. 
The second stage propelled the spacecraft even farther and faster into space, and after it detached, the third stage of the rocket fired briefly to knock Apollo into a parking orbit, 103 miles above the Earth's surface. Here, final checks were made, and the Saturn V fired again to set Apollo on course to the moon, in a move called the Translunar Injection. Once the spacecraft propelled away from Earth, the Saturn V's job was done. Now, the astronauts needed to pull off a mid-flight maneuver to reconfigure the ship so the crew could access the lunar module, which had been stored in a protective compartment during launch. To do this, the command service module detached and flipped 180 degrees, docking with the lunar module and extracting it. In the process, they ditched the third, now useless, stage of the Saturn rocket. This whole high-stakes launch process only took about three and a half hours, and this, the completed Apollo spacecraft, was the end result. For the next three days, Apollo coasted through space, until it finally reached its target and was pulled into orbit by the moon's gravity. This is where the crew split up. Armstrong and Aldrin transferred to the lunar module, named Eagle, and slowly descended toward the surface, while Collins continued to circle the moon in the command module, called Columbia. Now, here comes another tricky part, landing on the moon. To make this historic moment happen, Eagle turned and used its engine to slow its momentum and ultimately touch down on the lunar surface. The Eagle has landed. The moonwalk was broadcast live on television, immortalizing Neil Armstrong's words here. That's one small step for man, I think that was Neil's quote, I didn't understand it. You know, one small step for man, but I didn't get the second phrase. After about 21 and a half hours on the moon, Eagle performed the first launch from a celestial body that wasn't Earth, leaving its landing gear behind and timing its ascent with Columbia's path in lunar orbit to rejoin the spacecraft. This was the lunar Once Armstrong and Aldrin transferred back into the command module, the lunar module was no longer needed. So what came just back like was before, just a tiny Apollo part. to break out of orbit. This maneuver was called the Trans-Earth Injection, and began the two and a half day journey home. Upon approaching its entry point into Earth's atmosphere and no longer needing its propulsion engines, Apollo jettisoned the service module and prepared for re-entry, protected by the now exposed heat shield on the bottom of the command module. Apollo blazes across the heavens, coming back to Earth at 25,000 miles an hour. Parachutes deployed and Columbia splashed down safely into the Pacific Ocean. And what was once a 3,000 ton behemoth of rocket, fuel, and freight was reduced to this. A small command module floating in the ocean, carrying three astronauts and rock samples collected from the surface of the moon. Next. So this, this, so let's this start is with the components of the ship. Yeah. This is precisely uh, what is more important about lunar orbit rendezvous is that what you get back is just a small module. Okay, and that really saves a lot of fuel rather than sending the entire rocket to the uh, moon and then launching that rocket back from the moon and coming back here. Okay, so here another thing if you have noticed, uh, whenever, uh, when the last part uh, was actually getting into the lunar orbit, the third, uh, the, the section that was driving the uh, lunar orbiter, that rotated 180 degree. So if you have noticed in the video. So that is very much important because whenever you're trying to enter a lunar orbit, you have to decelerate. Okay, you want the lunar gravity to capture you. So you have to actually decelerate. So generally the, uh, the main uh, propulsion module, what is there, which guides the entire uh, system around moon, that is generally rotated 180 degrees, it will pull out the main system and then it enters a lunar orbit because you want to apply your uh, velocity in opposite direction so that uh, you know you decelerate. How do you decelerate otherwise? There is no way to decelerate in space. Okay, So you apply a velocity in opposite direction to how you are going to enter the lunar orbit and that will help you to slowly get captured into the lunar orbit. So that is how uh, uh, every, every mission, this is not only for Apollo, every mission is done that way. That to get captured into a lunar orbit, you have to fire in opposite direction and you will ultimately get captured. Okay, yeah. So this, uh, no, sorry, uh, behind, yeah. Uh, so, uh, previous one, yeah. So, this uh, image uh, is, un um, yeah, unfortunately, Apollo mission started off with uh, not in a good tone. Apollo 1, uh, all the three astronauts, uh, I mean, there was an explosion during the testing itself on the ground. So, it actually uh, started in a very bad note, but later, of course, uh, two, three, four, uh, five, six, and nine missions were all Earth orbits. They were trying Apollo 8 next was the first successful mission. It was a pilot mission to send, I mean, land astronauts uh, on moon. Okay, uh, next one. Yeah. So, three astronauts, uh, they did not land. They just orbited moon. 
but again they were the first ones to see the far side themselves they were in orbit for two days uh, they had gone around christmas eve so uh, they were in lunar orbit around two days uh, two uh, days completely and uh, finally uh, this is one interesting thing that they did is uh, they located the spots where Apollo 11 or the next missions can land. That was important. This was kind of a pilot test mission where they could go, astronauts could go see how is the con you know environment, as in not literal environment, but how are the conditions over there and what are the measures needs to be taken to land astronauts uh, on moon later. So, um, and they also took Earth images from moon. That was the first time we got very beautiful Earth images. Uh, they are famously called earth rise images so uh, the fact is that uh, since we only see one side of the moon we don't see the other side of the moon we actually from moon don't see earth rising so wherever you are on that side which faces the earth uh, your earth will appear to be fixed somewhere in the in the sky it will not appear, rise or set as we see moon rising and setting because of earth's rotation okay so uh, but these people were orbiting moon so they felt as if you know once they are moving towards earth they felt as if earth is rising so that's why these images were called earth rise uh, can we see next yeah so uh, this is the first image next so as they went in that direction they felt as if next earth is rising so these are series of images that they took and this became pretty famous because uh, this uh, this was the first clear images of earth that we got from a lunar distance actually and uh, of course as i said this was a pilot mission for uh, future apollo missions and next and of course in uh, july 1969 uh, first human landed on moon there were two of them who actually landed and the third one orbited we all know neil armstrong he's the first man to land on moon and the second one is uh, buzz aldrin his actual name is edward aldrin buzz is a nickname given by his sister because she couldn't say uh, brother so she used to call him buzz and that's the name he continued. So he's called Buzz Aldrin. Uh, so they were the uh, two astronauts which, uh, who landed on moon. And of course, this is a famous image of first foot on moon. Uh, there were a few interesting uh, observations that Neil Armstrong made. His first thing they had to do is, uh, you know, collect the soil, store it. In case if they have to abort the mission, their instructions were that first collect the soil store it in the module which is going to take off so if you have to abort the mission due to anything any any difficulty because this is the first time you have landed there we don't know what are the hazards that you will face on moon because nothing had landed only robotic missions have landed there before so uh, first thing they had to do is collect the soil and store it another thing that he observed is it was a fine sand like soil on moon it's called regolith now um, that was wherever they landed, that was not very deep. It was just five to six inch deep. And below that, there was a hard rock. Such a hard rock that generally, you know, when you're landing uh, anything, you have these exhaust gases, okay? So those exhaust gases of your lander generally crater the surface where you land. But what Neil Armstrong observed is wherever they had landed, the surface was intact. So the hard bedrock was really hard that even the exhaust gases from the lander couldn't really uh, crater that surface. So these were very initial observations that we got from this particular mission. And uh, these observations differ. Now we have seen that this regolith uh, chain, like it's uh, 5 to 6 inches deep to 30 to 40 meters deep. That is what we have observed. So now we have different missions landing at different positions. So this uh, uh, depth of regolith on moon surface is changing. It's not uniform. It is not like the rock is everywhere. It is five to six inch uh, below the surface. Okay, yeah, next. And then, uh, of course, um, uh, and there were Apollo 12 in between as well. But uh, the, the I would say this mission was definitely uh, not successful uh, considering its goals. But this is one of the mission that actually told us how much human brain can function <laughs> or rather how much human brain how good is human brain in disaster management okay uh, i'm sure some of you must have seen the movie apollo 13 uh, but this is uh, really uh, i mean a brilliant work done by the three astronauts one of them was also a part of apollo 8 so he was quite experienced going to moon but what exactly happened here is uh, there was an oxygen tank which was which had a history there was a problem in the oxygen tank which was kind of overlooked people knew but uh, it was repaired and um, it was overlooked during the mission and around 56 hours almost 2 lakh kilometers from here there was an explosion in the tank 
okay uh, so that tank exploded and along with it it also because of the explosion the other tank also started leaking okay and uh, these people first didn't realize they all all they felt was just a vibration of course and uh, they didn't realize that there was an explosion happening okay uh, after some time they just saw that something has been uh, you know something is exhausting very quickly okay uh, in space you can very easily understand if the entire oxygen star tank starts depleting and of course there were sensors which t uh, told them that okay the oxygen tank is depleting very fast okay uh, uh, initially they tried to seal things but then nothing happened of course contacting on the ground uh, station then finally they realized that okay there has been an explosion and some part of it has been now you can see this part of course this they came to know once they came back to earth close to earth and they saw that one entire side of that service module is gone so this is the actual image taken uh, from the lunar module so once they tried to mend things uh, sitting in the command service module generally the command and service module is joined together uh, but nothing happened they couldn't uh, do anything and they realized that they are depleting the oxygen very fast so their only option was to move to the lunar module which consisted which was made for two people to land on moon okay so they used that lunar module as a lifeboat uh, but now the problem was there were three people the lunar module also had supplies which were sufficient for two people oxygen was not an issue there were extra tanks of oxygen but water food everything that was only meant for two people there was a third problem actually uh, which was the space can we go ahead which was a space but this module is actually designed for two people so there is no space for the third person to sit okay so these were some practical difficulties that happened there they couldn't use the main module because that was depleting oxygen and they knew and it's it was open basically so they couldn't use that uh, the problem with explosion was the main module this main command module did not even have electricity because because of the explosion the electricity went out so uh, they had batteries on the lunar module which was only meant to sustain for two days and the trajectory they calculated meant that they would ne need at least four days to return back to earth even if they don't of course they cannot land on moon now but if they return it will be four days they had batteries sustaining only two days within space uh, they tried to engineer all these things of course uh, ground station helped them now the problem with ground station telemetry was the lunar module was connected to the service module which was supposed to orbit moon so they had to connect to ground station through the service module only so they actually controlled the service module from the lunar module and connected with the ground station and this all they did sitting there out in space 2 lakh kilometers away when there was an explosion in the space probe so uh, you can imagine what uh, situation it must have been not only that uh, can you go to the next slide biggest problem which we feel that okay it's not a big problem sitting here on the earth so when we exhale carbon dioxide it gets adsorbs onto the walls here we don't even realize but you know uh, if you are in a very compact room out there they realize that after some point of time uh, there was a, a dangerous level of carbon dioxide getting accumulated in the lunar module and they had to do something to let that out that is because again two people were, three people were cramped up in the designed module which was for two people so they connected there are these uh, carbon dioxide canisters so they literally used cardboard tapes and pvc pipes that were available to connect the service module canisters with the lunar module all this was again done in space not only that they see the trajectory which they had taken was supposed to land on moon uh, next sir uh, if you go with that same trajectory and turn around then they would miss earth because it was supposed to land on moon so now they had to correct the trajectory also now correcting trajectory was again that system was loaded into the service module which was exploded so now they had to do that correction the problem was generally how this correction is done is by looking at uh, some stars okay there are some reference stars and you know in which direction you are going so it's all done with that uh, with those stars the problem what was happening with these guys is there was tremendous exhaust happening with uh, oxygen and other uh, material and some debris also going out so they could not locate the stars that was a big problem and they had to uh, you know con consult the ground station ground station people actually changed certain programs from ground and they took sun as a reference and that entire program that system program was software was updated they took sun as a reference and with sun as a reference they finally came back to the trajectory which would allow them to land on earth so these were all the difficulties that happened 
and this all was done within you won't believe but changing the software generally takes a month of time those people ground station staff actually changed the entire software within 24 hours <coughs> so uh, disaster management up out in space disaster management down on the ground this is one excellent example of what humans can do uh, and they came back successfully by the way all three astronauts were safe they returned back to earth successfully okay so it's one of the best missions i always love to talk about this mission and yeah we can go ahead yeah so uh, so of course after that there were a uh, lot of other missions up to apollo uh, 21 which uh, sent out rovers uh, kernan was the last person on moon uh, who actually stayed on moon for 33 hours uh, but uh, the most important thing is what we got out of it yeah because uh, it's not only about apollo but apollo is a main game changer so one is liquid cool garments which we now regularly use for fire fighting and everything it all started with apollo missions because designing these garments of a, for the first time done for the astronauts on apollo missions next is frozen dried fruits which is a everyday habit for us now okay all instant foods that uh, that we use now the first start happened during apollo missions because of course you cannot cook in space you have microwave kind of things but you can only warm food hey, by the way that was another thing that uh, happened with uh, apollo 13 guys uh, they were depleting water also very fast the, <laughs> the drinking water they were depleting very fast so they actually were pretty dehydrated and what they decided to do is they did not have enough water to sustain three people again because they were in a lunar module and eventually they decided that they will eat all the liquid stuff that is there uh, you know uh, wet food that is there sealed wet food and that's the only source that they used for almost four days okay rather than having enough water because there was uh, less water uh, available on the lunar module yeah another thing is that revolutionized everything was the microchip that actually changed i mean developed the silicon industry totally from apollo missions and now we have everything as i said a small mobile phone also has 200 megapixel cameras uh, and you know it revolutionized everything it simply revolutionized everything and that was the biggest invention that happened after apollo missions and of course uh, some other materials like lightweight uh, uh, sport shoes and everything all the lightweight garments that we use now were actually initially developed for uh, apollo missions so these are few daily things that we have we don't even think where they have come from but <laughs> they were actually developed for astronauts before and now we use it every day all, uh, all those uh, materials okay. Uh, of course, uh, from Apollo missions, I would quickly like to go through before coming to Chandrayaan uh, about one interesting mission which China has undertaken since 2003. They have been silently, I wouldn't say silently doing it, but not uh, much hype has been given to this mission. But this mission, whatever, uh, they have taken five uh, missions so far and all of them have been successful. So their total program is initially, uh, they started off with orbiter missions, uh, uh, Chang'e 1 and Chang'e 2. Uh, then there were soft landers, Chang'e 3 and 4. And in uh, 2020, they sent out Chang'e 5, which returned 1.73 kgs of soil from lunar surface. And this is the maximum amount that we have got back so far. Okay, and uh, there are, um, they have a huge plan that by uh, they are also planning Chang'e 6 which is going to be very similar to Chang'e 5 that will also get around 2 kgs of soil back but uh, post that they are planning by 2027 they are planning a lunar research center uh, on moon which is going to be a great idea eventually every country is planning for that uh, but the fact that these missions have been all missions have been successful I'm quite sure that even this this will be a, a, a definitely a successful mission. So this is a very interesting um, ongoing mission that is going on um, Chang'e's project. And I have another very uh, short video which will help you to understand how the soil is collected from lunar surface. Okay, uh, can we go to the next one? So uh, this will show you how soil is collected, how it is docked, and how it is sent back to Earth. Okay. Um, so uh, the initial part can be. Uh, can we little forward your video? Yes, like <coughs> oh, Okay, in this, uh... no, it's okay. So initial part is about launching and all, but later once it goes to the moon, this will also show you that the orbit is similar to what we just saw for Apollo. 
more or less all orbits are same uh, you take multi either one or multiple orbits around earth and then uh, finally uh, you enter lunar orbit there also it depends whether you want to go for one or multiple orbits india generally prefers to have multiple orbits because again that saves more fuel okay the more the orbit around moon you moon or earth uh, you can always make use of gravitational assist to increase the diameter of your orbit slowly and slowly so that uh, uses minimum fuel generally but of course when you're talking about man missions uh, you cannot go for multiple orbits then you have to reduce the number of orbits because more orbit means you have to stay in space for a longer duration okay so this was the changi fai um, module which will go down and land on moon so the lander is now separated solar panels will be deployed so generally in any any mission uh, you know the first thing that happens is deploying the solar panels now you can see the drill machine goes down it will drill just to see how deep uh, the soil exists and what you know how hard where the hard rock is going to be then with uh, laser beams you can also scan that will pass the information about how deep the drilling machine has gone and you know um, you know how the surface is and then now this robotic arm Well, now this is a scoop that it will take the soil, store back into that tube, okay, and that robotic arm will store that tube onto the module, which will take off and dock with the orbiter, which is there orbiting the moon. So now this is stored inside, and now the the mission is complete, and now it will take off and it will join uh, the uh, orbiter, uh, which is orbiting the moon. So you can see how uh, by telemetry even the orbiter and the uh, the lunar module connects, um, sinks together. They also go in multiple orbits to sink and then they finally uh, dock together. So that is the orbiter. Now the lunar module has come towards it. It will take uh, one or two orbits just to ensure that. Uh, yeah. So now this cap is gone. the main orbiter has uh, rotated so that the lunar module can dock so now with telemetry they will align each other and then finally they will dock together so after docking now you will see that the sample from the lunar module is shifted towards that entire box is yeah you can see here that is transferred towards the main orbiter orbiter sealed and the lunar module will now be discarded okay so most of the missions discard the lunar module except apollo 11 apollo 11 lunar module was not discarded uh, it was uh, you know um, the reason is they wanted to study uh, you know what exactly happens yeah and uh, now the main orbiter is also discarded and the small capsule comes back uh so here there is another interesting thing if you saw that it bounced off the atmosphere and then uh, re-enter at another place okay so this is called skip re-entry so many a times if you want your uh, module to land at a certain position generally in sea then you do the skip re-entry what do you mean by skip re-entry is you reflect off the top layer of the atmosphere so that rather if it is coming straight down in a parabolic path like this it will get reflected and then land at a different place so if you want to increase the trajectory where it wants you know you want it to land uh, on earth then you can do skip reentry so many of these um, space crafts do that or they do that skip reentry to enter the earth atmosphere yeah next so coming to uh, next Indian missions Chandrayaan one, which was the most successful mission that we had. Uh, it was an orbiter and an impact probe. Uh, can we go ahead? This is an image from the ISRO lab, and of course, uh, this is uh, basically uh, the trajectory that we uh, took. 
So if you see it fired at this point at the bottom, then another orbit it took, then it fired, it will again fire at the bottom and then it will go into the translunar orbit. So this way if you have seen in the entire orbit around earth, it only fired once at that point which is closer to the earth. That is called perigee point, it's an elliptical orbit, so in an elliptical orbit you generally have a point which is closest to the earth and a point which is farthest away from the earth. So you generally fire at the perigee point so that your orbit diameter increases and you go on doing this multiple times, so you need to fire only at one point, that saves a lot of fuel, okay. And every time you fire you increase your orbit and eventually your final orbit will be such that the tip, the farthermost point is actually at a distance of the moon and that's where you actually put it in a translunar orbit and finally it goes to uh, the lunar orbit and near the lunar orbit as I said you have to decelerate it so you rotate 180 degrees so that moon is able to capture and the trajectory of the moon is also adjusted in such a way that you saw the moon uh, you know is going in that orbit and the timing is arranged in such a way that it finally gets captured around moon yeah, next. So uh, Chandrayaan 3 gave very, uh, Chandrayaan 1 gave lot of results but uh, interesting thing that we got, got for the first time was 3D images. Now this idea is very common, uh, most of the space uh, missions have this 3D mapping camera now but that time we got this 3D images of lunar surface. So how do you get a 3D image? It's not like you really click 3D, you have a 2D image and you have a topographical map. Uh, can we go ahead? So this is a topographical map, the data you get of the height uh, of the surface over there, okay. And from this data, using the 2D image, you uh, the software help you to generate the 3D image. So this was for the first time we got uh, 3D images of the surface of the moon and of course now this is a common principle. We did it for Mangalyaan and other countries also use such cameras. So if you go ahead, there is another such uh, image of uh, another surface of moon. Uh, if you see that crater, uh, there's one more, uh, yeah, if you see that crater in between, generally this, these are very uh, typical type of craters on moon. So if you have a direct impact, you know, the 90 degree impact, a perpendicular impact on the surface of the moon, uh, there is a crater that is formed and after some time the debris again falls down. It's a very uh, dry sandy soil that you have on moon. So generally most of these craters also have a mountain at the center of the crater. It's a very common feature on moon that uh, a crater is formed due to meteorite impact and then the debris fall in and you have a mountain being created. So this is that, so within the crater you have a mountain being created. It's a very common feature seen on the moon because of the dry soil that is present over there. Yeah, next. And of course the famous result, uh, what, is, what Chandrayaan 1 is known for is finding water on the surface of the moon. And uh, this is that cam uh, M3 camera, it was an infrared camera that gave us, if you see this is, uh, so Chandrayaan 1 orbited in the polar orbit. So uh, these are, this patches what you see, black patches is where you did not collect the data and the colored patches is where you've collected the data. This is a map that we got. So the blue region indicates that there is a present of a presence of water in either, uh, you know, combined form with other material or water ice. Okay, before this, before Chandrayaan 1, there were a lot of evidences of combined water, you know, some um, uh, uh, hydroxyl form or but, but presence of water. But Chandrayaan 1 actually gave us an actual data about, uh, you know, uh, that there is a concrete data of having water ice uh, in the craters uh, which are permanently shadowed near the poles. So what happens is sunlight is slanting near the poles, okay. So uh, there are certain craters which do not get sunlight at all. See, remember the temperatures on moon go from like plus 120 degrees to minus 200 degrees, okay. So uh, even if there is water on the surface of the moon, it will get evaporated. Any volatile material will get evaporated. So we don't find any volatile materials on the surface of the moon. It is only in the craters where sunlight never reaches you can find water and that's what Chandrayaan 1 discovered. Of course, the camera was uh, NASA's camera M3 uh, but uh, of course, um, it's a collaborative science and of course, we also got some presence of iron bearing uh, minerals, the red regions indicate that and this all was done at the infrared wavelengths of r roughly between 2.4 to 3 uh, microns. That was a wavelength that was used to uh, measure this. So why infrared is because you have a lot of infrared absorption whenever there is a presence of water. So if you have, uh, if you detect that infrared absorption, that 
actually generally tells you that there is a presence of water. Water absorbs infrared trees. So that is why infrared cameras are mainly used to detect water, uh, if you have to detect water. Then, yeah, next. Yeah, these are the regions, the blue patches where you see are the regions. This is the South Pole and that is the North Pole. So you can see here the South Pole is showing more uh, water, content of water than the North Pole. Okay, and that is why this race towards the South Pole. You know, we could have gone to any poles, but uh, it show, it's, it's actually showing more water on the South Pole than the North Pole. And that is the reason. So you must be wondering, right, why there are so many missions going to moon and why it was only Chandrayaan 1 which gave a concrete result. The main idea is all the missions, I have a map I'll show you, were mainly orbiting in the equatorial plane. Chandrayaan 1 orbited in the polar regions. We never saw the poles before. We never tested for poles. So this was the first mission which actually went in the polar orbit and that is why we could actually detect the presence of water. Because in the equatorial region there is no water surface. There is, it's so hot, they will not find water over there. Okay, yeah, next. Yeah, so this is a map you can see. Uh, these were all the previous missions that landed or, yeah, the mainly the landing missions. So these were all near the equatorial regions. Uh, hardly just Chang'e 3 has been a little up uh, near the North Pole and Chang'e 4 has been closer to the South Pole but not really South Pole as such. On the far side, Chang'e 4 landed on the far side. But uh, Chandrayaan, Chang'e 4 is much recent actually, Chandrayaan 1, uh, after Chandrayaan 1. So, uh, that is the reason we couldn't detect water before, but of course there were evidences, but not concrete ones. And uh, yeah, water is important if you have to go, uh, you know, have a future missions, uh, maybe a research center. Having a research center on moon is a very great idea. Because we have, we have a research center in ISS that is orbiting Earth, International Space Center, which does a lot of experiments. Obviously, um, uh, one thing is International Space Station is uh, the funding and the uh, functioning of that space station is going to end by 2030. All countries are backing out now. Uh, it's been a long time, so maintenance is more uh, expensive than sending another uh, space station. So the idea now, of course, people are planning to have another space station. China has already um, sent Tiangong 1, 2, they are trying for that. India is also thinking about having space station but more than that if we can have a space station on moon then it is going to be more concrete rather than keeping it orbiting around earth it is a good idea to have space stations on moon uh, for multiple things you can do science experiments that is one thing and it can in near future it can also be a kind of a step to go to mars to send humans to mars okay so right now also in iss we have humans uh, staying there continuously every six months uh, they are replaced by another set of astronauts. See, we can do that on moon. But uh, definitely that, that's going to be a good idea. And with, you know, initially it was a problem because there were limited space shuttles. We had only few space shuttles from NASA and Russia which could take astronauts. Now all space shuttles from NASA are shut down. They don't have any new space shuttles. It's only Russian space shuttles that are used. But considering uh, people like Elon Musk giving out, uh, you know, the private industry giving out space shuttles, this thing can be started again, you know, that's actually a good idea. Yeah, uh, going ahead, yeah, next. And um, so this is the impact site, as I showed you the impact site of Luna 25, this is the impact site of Chandrayaan 2. So of course it was very unfortunate that in the last few uh, minutes uh, this thing happened, but uh, it's a part of every space exploration. Uh, to tell you very frankly, considering all space exploration, 50% of space exploration, moon exploration, uh, systems have gone wrong there was only it's we have only 50 percent success throughout the world if you consider so it's very difficult as i said can we go ahead and uh, what exactly yeah but before that um, what exactly went wrong with chandrayaan 2 but before that we are actually getting some interesting results on chandrayaan 2 orbiter so the lander failed i agree but uh, the orbiter is still giving us interesting results and its life is supposed to be for seven years, the orbiter. So definitely we are going to get excellent results. This is one of the, I'm sure, I mean, I'm not going to go into a lot of technical things. So don't bother about the graph, but this is what they've published. I'll just quickly tell you what they are. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, we generally get a lot of solar flares, right, from the sun. And we have this 11 year cycle of the sun where the number of solar flares increase and then the number of solar flares decrease, okay? So we see lot of solar flares. Now current period is where we have lot of solar flares, the activity is very high. But there in between you have uh, 
uh, activities where it is very low and you get very low minimum solar flares okay which many a times go undetected on earth but we have an xsm unit X, uh, it's a x-ray solar uh, monitor which is put on chandrayaan 2 which is observing sun see this is very interesting you have a unit which is orbiting moon and from lunar this where there is no atmospheric hindrance or any other uh, charged particle zones which are around earth you are trying to observe sun so there was these micro micro flares which are generally missed around earth were detected from moon during low activity of sun so this is a very interesting result that we've got from chandrayaan 2 next there's another interesting features that we have observed uh, on surface of the moon is something known as lobate scars so these are formed due to tectonic movements you've seen this on earth okay when two plates come and crash there is a hill kind of a thing being formed so these kind of observations were done by chandrayaan 2 orbiter as well so these so which also tells us that there are tectonic moments on moon okay and that is the reason in chandrayaan 3 we put another unit to measure moon quakes okay there is an instrument on the lander to measure moon quakes because there are tectonic moments happening on the lunar surface okay next and coming to why lunar uh, chandrayaan 2 failed so uh, this I'm sure many of you must have seen this plot. This was published by a lot of newspapers uh, on the day of landing. So what it exactly tells you is, see, whenever you are orbiting the moon, it is uh, generally uh, horizontal. You know, your space shuttle or your unit is horizontal because you are orbiting the lunar uh, your moon. Okay, but when you have to land it, you have to make it vertical. Okay, so this is the tricky part. So you have thrusters which you have to fire the thrusters in such a way to make it perfectly vertical hover about this about the surface where you want to land and then slowly it comes down and that making it vertical is very important and that's where chandrayaan 2 went wrong okay so there were five thrusters in chandrayaan 2 one extra at the center which actually gave it more thrust than required so rather than if you can go ahead uh, rather than becoming vertical, it actually tilted by more degrees. It was supposed to rotate by 55 degrees, it tilted by 410 degrees. Okay. What happened because of that, it, it did not reach the spot which was on which it was supposed to hover. Okay. Its velocity should go to zero. If you see there, when it becomes perfectly vertical, its velocity, both horizontal and vertical velocity should go to zero. Okay. The speed has to be zero. What it shows is, it is hovering above the vertical speed zero means you are balancing with the gravity of the moon so whatever you are giving a thrust which is acting upwards moon's gravity is going to pull you down so speed is zero means you have balanced it and you are in control to come down safe safely so it has to go to zero which did not go to zero the reason is the software was given an area very small area uh, to land okay it was just 500 meters by 2.5 kilometers that was the area which was decided to land uh, because of the wrong tilting uh, the software tried to increase the velocity of uh, the uh, chandrayaan 2 lander because it was one kilometer away from the area where it was supposed to land so rather than reducing the velocity it increased the velocity and it crashed that was the problem actually because of that extra thruster and this precaution was actually taken in chandrayaan 3 where that central thruster was removed there were one more velocity detector unit was added it was a doppler unit which was added that once you come down you measure with what speed you are coming down so that was added uh, we saved the weight by not sending a huge orbiter with lot of instruments we just have a propulsion module with one instrument okay and which is going to only work for six months so we have a chandrayaan 2 orbiter already so we don't need another orbiter to go around moon so we use that weight in making the legs of chandrayaan 3 more robust they were very robust. So generally you come down, uh, maximum speed expected is 2 meter per second when you come down, the downward speed. Okay. Uh, even if you, this Chandrayaan 3 would have come down with 3 meter per second, it would have still sustained. So the legs were made more robust. The weight could be balanced over there. So these are the precautions that were taken. Uh, of course, the most important precaution that was taken was extending the area. Previously, it was 500 meters by 2.5 kilometers. Now, the area chosen was 4.5 kilometers by 2.5 kilometers. So, if even something goes wrong, the software will not, you know, uh, try to uh, accelerate it because it's a long area. It's a big area it has been given. So, it can land anywhere in that area. So, that, that these precautions were actually taken. And, you know, these last few minutes, ground stations cannot do anything. 
the inbuilt software only has to do everything. So you have to design your instrument in such a way that it will be capable to take its own decision if something goes wrong. And those precautions were taken in Chandra N3 now. Okay, next. So, <laughs> yeah, this is the same thing that I've already discussed. We can go ahead. Yeah. This is another tricky problem. We are trying to land on South Pole. We are all happy that, okay, there is water. We want to establish a space station. Everything is fine, but see the area where we are trying to land. Okay, if anything goes wrong, you know, you will land up in the crater. Now, the problem with the crater, it is fine to land in the crater. That is not an issue. You will still safely land. The problem with the crater is there is no sunlight in most of the craters here. So, your solar panels will not work. And this is precisely which had happened previously, not with Indian mission, but there was a very interesting mission taken by EAC and NASA together. That is Rosetta mission on one of the comets. Okay, and they had landed on a comet. They had landed a lander on a comet and unfortunately that lander went into a crater. It landed on a crater and it couldn't revive. They tried to revive that again after a year, but due to lack of sunlight in the crater, that mission was dead. It didn't give us enough data as expected. Same thing, it was a problem with landing on the South Pole. Why all this hype about why it is... See, we have achieved so many landings before. So what is so difficult about landing on the South Pole? It's heavily cratered. Few kilometers here and there and you will land in a crater. So you have to really take care of that. So that, that was an issue. Yeah, next. Yeah. Uh, this I have already discussed. We can go ahead. Yeah. Some results, again, graph, don't worry about it. This just tells you that some of the minerals that has been uh, found on the South Pole. And of course, this mission, Chandrayaan-3 mission, was of course only meant for 14 days. Uh, the reason is we need sunlight and on moon, 14 days there is day, 14 days there is night. So, uh, one way we could have revived it is by putting heaters on the uh, lander and the rover. But of course, this was the first mission that landed and landing was the main priority. That was more important. So of course, I'm sure the future missions will be uh, where we will be taking care that more than 14 days we will be able to, uh, you know, sustain our units so we get more such robust results. Yeah, can we go ahead? And of course, it also measured the depth, uh, uh, I mean, temperature uh, uh, changes in the depth, okay, both the Pragyan rover and um, the Vikram Lander did this experiments, of course. Um, and we also, some of you must have seen the video there where the rover was walking, uh, going and it encountered a crater and it turned around and uh, those those uh, videos were released by ISRO. So, uh, all these systems, uh, you know, have become more robust now that uh, the rover will be able to decide how far I want to go, then I'll turn around. All this, it's all inbuilt in the software. So, this was more of a technological demonstration that we wanted to do for future missions, basically. Now, we know that, okay, this this works, this, uh, this uh, all this taking these precautions work, how we can do the safe landing. And we can, you know, implement it in future mission. But as I said, every mission is a new mission. You, you have, of course, you have information from the previous missions, but still every mission is still a new mission where anything can go wrong. Can you go ahead? Yeah. There is one last slide which I wanted to discuss quickly. Uh, this is not being discussed at many places and even ISRO released it pretty late. Uh, this is a very interesting experiment that ISRO did was after landing, after two, three days, it made the lander take off and again basically hop and again come down. Now this is very important because if we are planning to send landers which are going to come back to earth again, taking off from the surface of the moon is something that we have to test. Okay? So you can just see this video. Uh, you will only see dust for a few seconds before and then you will see going up and coming down. It is taken from onboard camera so you don't see the lander. So this is the region uh, besides the lander and once it takes off the exhaust starts you can see the dust being uh, this is the dust uh, the lunar soil being uh, blown off because of the exhaust and then you will see it's slowly going up yeah it's very dusty actually so, uh, rather than going here yeah, you can see it's come down again so this hopping test was also taken what it tells you is yes your thrusters are capable of hopping back from the moon okay so next mission maybe we can get the soil back to earth so that that all those plans were there so let's hope that we have 
future missions and of course we are also next slide we are also planning to collaborate with uh, jaxa japanese space agency for future missions and of course uh, collaboration is always a, a good method you know like we are always proud that okay our country did that but it's always better to have collaboration so like you know all of us are better with different technologies like our rockets are really good you know um, you know but there are certain instruments which are developed better by nasa or esa or even japan for that matter so just we saw in chandrayaan 1 it's our module chandrayaan module but the, the camera which detected water was nasa's so this actually helps because you know we get the data we, we the, both the countries get the data which is more important we we are capable of uh, you know you know buying the data from other countries always expensive so if you collaborate with countries where one instrument is from you one instrument is from us both the countries benefit that way so always uh, doing uh, things in collaboration in your future is always better and with Gagan, Gaganyan of course the launch escape system we just had a test I'm sure these things will go ahead uh, very soon okay so thank you so much thank you so much ma'am and uh, you know for something which is so technical and like we had spoken earlier uh, we were also apprehensive you know whether we will understand or not but uh, I'm sure most of us have at least got a lot more and, and, and a much better understanding so a big thank you I have already got some questions like always uh, from my research team and from some of the audience members. Uh, so again, if, if you have questions, please please pass them on. Our volunteers will move around the aisles. Uh, so let me just start with uh, one or two of the questions that you have. Uh, and focusing first on Chandrayaan. Uh, you know, what do you think will be the sort of motive for establishing a human base on the moon? And, and like a lot of research and space has been, Will it be military? Will it be minerals? Or what exactly do you think will be driving us for, for being there? Uh, majorly, it's definitely uh, science research because, uh, you know, just as we have done zero gravity experiments in ISS and all, so we can also, uh, not exactly zero gravity, I should use the word microgravity, it's not zero. But, you know, uh, maybe we can also uh, think of, you know, if you have, want to have long-term establishment on moon, then the first and the foremost objective will be to actually sustain human life properly on moon. You know, there are a lot of hazards, as I said, there's no atmosphere, a lot of meteor impacts and also sustaining that, developing robust systems to, you know, safeguard humans is going to be the first priority. And of course, after that, as I said, it can be one of the stepping stones to go to Mars and beyond, if you have to send human uh, beyond. So that is one thing. But apart from that, of course, so the robotic space stations are also, um, you know, those ideas are also on the forefront because doing a certain science experiments in lunar atmosphere is important. So we don't know what results. And as you said, minerals, yes. If we can uh, extract fuels right from the moon, lunar surface and not really carry it from here, then of course it can become a big robust for our future missions. Uh, another point there, uh, do you think having a base on the moon will give us a better way of exploring the solar system itself? Yes, it can, definitely. It can, yes, uh, for multiple reasons. It, as I said, it's, it's a stop hop, so definitely it can give a better, uh, you know, uh, way of exploring solar system. Uh, moving to some of the uh, other space missions, uh, could you just tell us a little bit more about the Gaganyaan mission? So, uh, we are developing a space shuttle which will take uh, humans out in space. The first idea is obviously orbiting Earth and then we'll be thinking about sending uh, towards Moon. Uh, we have excellent rockets right now, that's not an issue. But uh, to send uh, humans in space, you at least require a rocket which will be able to uh, give 8 tons, will be able to carry 8 tons, that is 8,000 kgs. So the current GSLV Mark III, with which we sent Chandrayaan-3, uh, has a capacity, uh, especially near GTO. What I mean by GTO is the geostationary transfer orbit where most of our communication satellites sit. That is roughly 36,000 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. Okay, so to send humans at least to that uh, distance, we need um, current capacity is 4 tons, that is 4,000 kg, 4.5 tons is the current capacity. So we have to develop a rocket which will be at least 8 tons, so that is one idea. 
Another thing with uh, Gaganyan is uh, what recently we undertook that uh, test was launch escape system. So if you saw that video about Saturn V, there was a launch escape system at the top of the rocket, which is a must when you are taking human missions. Okay, because if anything goes wrong during launch, it is the launch escape system which takes that module where humans are sitting and it will come back to Earth safely. So we just had a test uh, for Gaganyan recently where there was a dummy model of the, uh, uh, the module where humans are going to crew module and uh, it, it, it was uh, successful. We developed a launch escape system. The dummy test was successful just a few, few days ago in fact. So we are working on it. Uh, similarly, maybe if you can enlighten us uh, on, on the Mangalyaan mission and, and any other interplanetary missions which you think we are already planning or which are in the offing from an India perspective. So, uh, Mangalyaan was another interesting uh, mission. Again, uh, we do have some scientific results, but again, that was majorly for uh, achieving the technology of putting uh, something in the Martian orbit. Okay. Um, uh, as I said, there are uh, some challenges for lunar landing. Similarly, there are certain challenges for uh, Mang, uh, you know, Mars orbit uh, injects as well. So the good part about it is it was our first mission and we were successful right in the first mission itself. Another thing is, you know, uh, Mars is much farther away from the moon. So again, you need more fuel to reach to that uh, distance. And with Mangalyan, we could actually demonstrate that with this multiple orbit trajectory that we generally have, where we keep on increasing the orbit every uh, trajectory, every orbit. So that actually helps us to reduce a lot of fuel, you know. So low cost systems that we developed to, uh, you know, send missions to moon was interesting. There is another important thing that we tested in Mangalyan mission was, see generally uh, with the moon that is not a problem. So any satellite that goes beyond, uh, you know, on the other side of the moon or Mars, we cannot directly contact with them for those many minutes. With moon it's not an issue because the time is much less, okay, just two minutes or something. But with Mars it is almost 19 minutes, uh, we are not connected with the system, okay. So when we actually injected uh, Mangalyan into the Mars orbit, it actually got injected on the far side. So for 19 minutes, we had no idea whether the injection happened properly or not. Okay, so that telemetry, that connection, re-establishing the connection and all those things were actually demonstrated very well in Mangalyan. So that was another technological thing that we wanted to test before, before going ahead with other missions. Yeah. Uh, and then the last one which we did almost immediately after Chandrayaan, which was the Aditya. Uh, something more on that as well. Yeah, so Aditya mission is uh, not really a probe. It is going to sit at one point, which is, uh, what do you say, a balanced gravity point. So there are such five such points called Lagrangian points between. So this comes from a simple Newtonian mechanics. I won't go into the details of it. But uh, basically there are five points around any two objects. Okay, the, the two objects are, in, are gravitationally bound to each other. There are five points in space which are kind, you can say that the gravitational force is nearly zero because of the interaction of both the objects together, okay? So if you uh, put anything at those points, then they stay there safely, okay? Uh, they are stable points, okay? So L1 is such point which is between Earth and Sun. So generally these points are, one is between Earth and Sun, one is uh, behind Earth, one is behind Sun, and there are two points at 60 degree angle from the Earth. So these are these five points. So we have put Aditya L1, we will be putting, it's still not reached there. We will be putting Aditya L1 near this uh, point L1. So this is point, this point is exactly between Earth and Sun. So there is no Earth obstruction. It will continuously uh, observe Sun, but orbit around, uh, along with the Earth. So it is going to go around Sun in same one year as Earth goes. But it will be sitting in between Earth and Sun and continuously orbit, you know, observing Sun. So it is not a solar probe, it's not going to go to Sun. It is going to stay relatively closer to Earth, Earth but it is going to con constantly observe Sun. Okay, so it is mainly for the solar study. And it is on the way, it has not reached that point yet. But it has escaped the Earth's atmosphere uh, region. It is beyond Earth's atmospheric region now. Uh, so I know you mentioned about uh, you know what India has managed in terms of uh, managing costs, but there are two aspects we just wanted you to help us with. Uh, first, you know the whole 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 solar space is very capital heavy. So uh, and the second is of course the running costs of the opex. So if you can throw light on both separately, you know what have we done or where are we doing to make the capital cost lower, and then the second is what are we doing to make sure that we can do the missions itself 
in low running costs? Yeah, so one thing is uh, ISRO has funding from two. Uh, one is the governmental funding and other is the self-funding thing. So we, gen we launch uh, satellites from other countries. So that actually gives us a lot of funding. So that is one very good idea to do that. Of course, ISRO also has some excellent sensors which it uh, gives out and that is so it's it's uh, partially self-funded so that is one thing of uh, getting generating the capital and other thing is yes uh, reducing the fuel designing trajectories which are cost effective designing instruments which are cost effective is another uh, good thing about reducing the cost and uh, third thing is as i said is collaboration you know you need not de design or device everything here if you can collaborate with other countries for every mission, then definitely it becomes more balanced. You get enough science data, but at the same time it becomes more cost effective as well. Yeah. Uh, so going forward again, uh, do you think India can keep its competitiveness in the space uh, arena A, based on its uh, cost advantage or is there anything else that we need to do to remain competitive or ahead? Uh, it's both actually. I mean, cost is one factor which has been really a great idea in India because uh, we are able to launch satellite with really low cost for other countries as well. So that has helped. But apart from that, yes, uh, science, uh, the development of science that is going on right now, and with uh, you know uh, giving, uh, making it open to the private industries actually boosted it in some way. You know, previously it used to happen that uh, only few research institutions in India used to develop everything. But now considering that you know uh, the other industry has been opened up, I'm sure some of the parts or whatever uh, the uh, you know the infrastructure that you need will be developed more quickly. You know, uh, the, the time because because see most of these missions are kind of time based. You have to make them ready before certain things. You know, you cannot just keep on saying that okay after ten years I will learn something. That's not going to help you. Okay, so uh, if you have to really uh, uh, you know uh, make it fast forwarded, then definitely opening up to private industries is actually a good idea. So definitely it might give a better boost to um, uh, these things. Uh, since you brought this topic up, I think one question is, uh, you know, India is considered to be home to so many startups and, 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 and you spoke about Elon Musk as well. What role do you see for startups in the space industry itself? Uh, uh, recently also I had read something about Chandrayaan 3 that there were two or three startups which actually provided a lot of uh, useful, uh, of course there were big companies like l &T which also provided but there were few starters also who were involved in providing some small systems to Chandrayaan 3. So looking forward I guess even that uh, can change a lot of things about and uh, considering that uh, funding has been given to such uh, startups or uh, you know these things have been uh, kind of uh, uh, boosted. Uh, so I think it can actually change a lot of things in future. But uh, I mean, I, I'm not the right person to actually comment on that very frankly. Uh, 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 but I think, yeah, this will definitely uh, boost our space research uh, more than what is, as it has been before. Uh, coming to a slightly different point, ISRO, as we all know, is, is you know, a government funded and it's predominantly a research sort of uh, orientation. Then we now talk of guys like Elon Musk from the other side coming. So is the research mindset changing somewhere to a commercial mindset? Uh, do you see that happening? Do you think it should happen? What's your view over there? Uh, personally, uh, see, if you talk about research mindset, uh, yes, I can see it changing very frankly. Everywhere. It's not only about India. It's everywhere. But at the same time, uh, it... Uh, I don't know, like see, it, it has to be balanced very frankly. This is my personal view. It has to be balanced. You cannot, as I said, you if it is only government institutes or, you know, very few institutes who are trying to develop something, then a uh, lot of things are restricted in the sense that uh, even employment kind of a thing, if you see, then a lot of things are actually restricted. If you have widespread industry, then definitely a lot of people can work into it and you'll get results quickly. Okay, so, uh, but once you're going into this mass production or fast forwarding things, then definitely to some extent, the goal of science somewhere, which a typical research mindset that fortunately or unfortunately, even I have, uh, <laughs> well, I'm using this word because uh, personally we feel that, okay, we are doing this for science, not for a space race, you know, this, the quality has to be such, the, it has to be this, or we should get more science data. For example, even Mangalyan mission, it was a technological feat, but we got 
relatively lesser science data. So with a research mindset, we feel that, okay, you should get much more data from it. But at the same time, as I said, you know, there has to be a balance. You cannot delay a mission to, uh, you know, uh, build a really uh, extremely better instruments. You know, there has to be categories. You have to fast forward it to achieve certain technological fields and at the same time uh, have little more of science data as well. So it has to be balanced. Uh, you spoke about you know collaboration as as one of the key things. Uh, could you could you sort of give us some idea on where you think India and specifically NASA is collaborating? If you can throw some more light, or any other countries where we are collaborating. Uh, in fact, we are collaborating with lot of countries right since start. So the initial uh, launch vehicles, actually the spare parts we got from the engines, the liquid engines that we used were actually French before. Later we developed the Vikas engine and even the cryogenic engine and now ISRO is trying to develop a semi-cryogenic engine. So cryogenic engine is where you know uh, you have cooled down liquefied oxygen and uh, hydrogen where uh, they are in separate tanks and they, actually a cryogenic engine gives you more thrust than the normal liquid engines. Okay, So all these are developed later but initially all these things are uh, collaborated and uh, you know, imported. Now also uh, NASA, of course, NASA has been collaborating with us for a lot of missions. It's not only um, Chandrayaan or Mangalyaan, even uh, AstroSat mission, if you see, uh, the main, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the main mirrors or the main body of every, all the five instruments have been made in India, but the detectors have been uh, imported from other countries. So this collaborative uh, missions have been going on, it's, it's every, you know, this has been there in every mission actually. So, and this will continue. It's not like for one single mission or something. And all countries, whether it is ESA or it is JAXA, or we have been collaborating with uh, most, even Russia for that matter. In fact, uh, uh, this uh, Pragyan rover, which was made for Chandrayaan 2, uh, Russia was going to give us. But that same rover failed. They had sent a similar rover to Mars, and that failed. And that is the reason uh, they decided not to give it to India. And we had to develop it in three years, actually. So uh, it was then made in India. Uh, so one of the topics we keep hearing nowadays about is artificial intelligence. Uh, do you see any applications where you think AI or ML will accelerate what we are doing? A lot of them. A lot of them. Because as I said that, you know, in those last few minutes where you have to land, it is the software that does everything. So if uh, we can use, make, so far we did not have any missions with artificial intelligence, but you know, if we can implement artificial intelligence to this, uh, you know, uh, missions, then definitely that uh, troubleshooting part can be more efficient. You know, anything goes wrong, then troubleshooting part can be more efficient. So, AI is definitely going to play a lot of uh, role in your future now. Uh, you know, you mentioned about uh, Apollo 13, the movie, uh, and you know, one uh, one nice movie can make a lot of difference. Uh, we saw Akshay Kumar doing the same with the Mangalyan. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, those are uh, one attempt, but how can we create more awareness and probably a better liking for this subject in the younger generation and attract more talent into this field? Okay, one thing is obviously getting people involved. Okay, uh, so we have seen, uh, ISRO has just started, we are new to it, but uh, if you see NASA's uh, web pages, then there is something known as citizen science programs, which I've been running a lot, okay, where they get normal general citizens involved into analyzing some data. Okay, so there, there's a lot of data available free, of course, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, on different topics, it's not only about missions, but there are a lot of data freely available where you can use it. They have developed uh, small, small module softwares which you can download and run that data and get the result out, uh, you know, yourself. There are a lot of, uh, what do you say, kind of competitions and asteroid hunting or comet hunting programs that have been undertaken and there are a lot of people from India, I know at least uh, two or three people who have, so I know one person uh, who is who's from Domuli and he has been actually, he has uh, searched for like 26 comets using SOHO data, sun grazing comets. So there are a few comets named after him as well. So there, there are a lot of people who are doing that from India as well. So if we are able to release such data and get students or even general public involved in it, definitely people will like, you know, there are a lot of even like undergraduate students who are interested in doing this, okay, for their college projects or any or even general public. So all guidelines uh, should be given, of course, on how to run these pro codes and everything. But 
these softwares are very simple. Whatever, if you download any of these NASA softwares, they're very simple. All data sheets are given and how you should run. And a simple, like 10 to 12 standard students uh, will be able to easily access that and do that. So if such things are developing, I, I recently saw that there was a competition for uh, one such competition uh, on ISRO's website as well. So we have recently started this. But yes, such programs and of course, uh, public talks or you know more uh, video releasing or all these things can definitely boost popularizing astronomy basically in India. We, we are hoping that our attempt to get such a young speaker will probably add to it because we were really looking forward to, to, to hosting you. But anything you can suggest for a normal Villa Parle audience or a other audience that, that we should be doing uh, to further this sort of an activity? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I'll think over it. Immediately, I cannot think. But yeah, there can be a couple of workshops where some basic things can be done. Like that's and uh, so we have Sir here, Planetary, yeah, <laughs> uh, Planetary Director. Yeah. Mention, he uh, has been Arun doing. Arun Paran Sir is here. Uh, thank you to him because uh, you know we got this hall a bit last minute. Uh, we reached out to him and he said, "I'll suggest a very good speaker to you, but you should do this." So thank you, Sir, for 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 that help again. Sir has been already doing a lot of workshops in planetarium for students and general publics. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, you know, uh, making a complex subject with a lot of technicalities sound palatable is an art. Uh, and for a scientist like you to have mastered that art at such a young age is truly commendable, ma'am. So, Dr. Nagar, a very big thank you to you for basically presenting this subject uh, in such a simple manner to all of us. So uh, now for a just a uh, small word of thanks, a formal one. First and foremost to our speaker, uh, Dr. Vinita Suresh Navalkar for agreeing to deliver this talk at a very short notice. Uh, Paranspe sir for helping us find the speaker at, uh, at short notice. Thanks to BMC for the hall, uh, Avinash Paradkar for sound and screen, uh, Virag Vision for videography, Vastu Shobha for the stage, uh, Shri Tendulkar uh, and, and Sairaj Publicity for the banner's backdrop. Our uh, elected representatives, Parag Arunji and Abhijit Samanji, make it to every program and thank you to both of them for being here today as well. And our family keeps growing. We feel very happy about it. We are now about 360 contributors, 125 of them have made repeat contributions. Uh, our database is now 3000 plus. Uh, YouTube, we've just crossed 22 and a half thousand subscribers. Uh, and the biggest thank you is to all of you. I mean, our audience of today, uh, and our audience which comes every time. So a very big thank you to all of you. Uh, keep this love, affection and support flowing and growing. Uh, and join us for our next program. We know the date and the speaker and the topic. It is on Sunday, 10th December. Uh, the speaker is Advocate Vishnu Shankar Jain and the talk is titled Vyavastha ki Chokhat par Aastha Kahani, Gyan Vyapi aur Mathura ki. Uh, so with that, uh, please do join us next time and let's close today's program with a rendition of Ande Matra.